So what we want to talk to you about today is about seizing the AI opportunity. Um, and what we really mean by this is AI has been around now for decades, but what we're really starting to see is it becoming in part of the mainstream. Organizations of all shapes and sizes are starting to adopt AI um, technologies, um, and many are going through that learning curve at the moment. And towards the kind of end of this introduction, I want to kind of illustrate where we think many organizations are and the kind of different stages of that adoption. But really, all of you are probably well aware of the benefits of AI. Many of your organizations will uh, have planned to leverage AI um, to solve many problems, um, supply chain problems, uh, marketing problems, customization problems, things like that. And these are all very well suited to what AI can do. So what we really wanted to kind of frame up is where we see the biggest benefits of AI and the various um, lenses that we um, that we apply to businesses. So can it be used to maximize revenue? If you can maximize revenue, you can self-fund these initiatives. And that's one of the big drivers that we see from a lot of our organizations that we work with is that these, these programs have a cost associated with it. There's a, there's a risk entailed to it. But if there's an upside associated with maximizing revenue that you can self-fund, it becomes a lot sweeter. And what, what I mean by maximizing revenue is how can you drive incremental business? So is that making your product more attractive or finding areas of the market, customer bases that you may not be getting the full potential from because you're not analyzing the full breadth of data available to you? And you think about um, the likes of some of the big supermarkets, their loyalty programs ingest a huge amount of um, purchase behavior information. Um, and you can start to see that if someone's buying something on a recurring basis and then they're buying something else and then their behavior changes, that maybe something has happened in their life. And there's a very, very um, poignant example that sticks out to me back from when I was in the UK, um, that Tesco, um, Dunhunby, the, um, their, data their data science division, or it's now split out as its own separate company, they were analyzing the Tesco club card data and they actually sent vouchers to a club card member that said, oh, we think you'll be really interested in these products. And one of the products was nappies. And this was sent to a 16 year old girl. The father opened this letter from Tesco going, oh, we've got some new vouchers, this would be nice. Why are they sending us nappies? And they, they asked um, Tesco, like, this is um, irrelevant for us. Why are you sending us these things? And then he had to have the embarrassing conversation um, a couple of weeks later with his daughter who actually was pregnant and she hadn't told her parents. And it really shows how powerful data can be that even things that people can't see and you interact with these people on a day-to-day -day basis, there are underlying trends that are so subconscious that we kind of just get on with it. So maximizing revenue is linked to kind of that elevating experience. People are more likely to pay more money if they feel like they're getting better value out of it. And that could be improving the engagement, making something really personalized to you, or it could be using those um, data feeds to identify those gaps in the market. So in particular, um, the recommendation engines that we see with the likes of Netflix, with Spotify, even uh, Airbnb is going in that direction now. Based on your previous history of where you've stayed, what are the places that you might like to stay in? And it's trying to drive and inform people. It's pushing ideas into people's mind. Amazon is obviously front and center of this. They have built their entire organization with data from the ground up. And Bezos um, has been very determined that each time a new service has been introduced, they are thinking about what is the data that can be underpinned that can then create new services, new value, new insight to then develop their new uh, products. So a great example of this is the kind of Amazon marketplace where new um, vendors can bring on their own products and sell things. But Amazon has kind of view, purview of all of that data and where they start to see things selling well, then that is a, a signifier for them to actually say, well, maybe we need to introduce that type of product. We're gonna go to our vendors and go and buy um, this widget that might be travel adapters. I mean, probably not at the moment, but when travel gets going, I can, I can imagine that demand for that is going to increase again. 
So it's using all of these different data feeds. Cost is another big area, risk another one. Understanding world events, ingesting um, kind of real-time data feeds about the news, what is happening in different locales, and linking that to your personal supply chains can help you identify what is the risk. If there's going to be a strike in a certain area, in a port, what does that have an impact to your supply chain and the downstream impact? And so some of the, the leading organizations that were distributing PPE, when they noticed that certain Chinese ports and airports were getting um, clogged up with all of the, the outbound, they were much quicker to um, adapt and switch their supply chains to different locations um, and therefore get ahead of the schedules and make sure that they could get their products into market um, whilst capacity was built. And so AI has a huge amount of power and it really comes down to AI is the tool, but what is the use case you're trying to solve for? And I think that's where we really find our clients struggle a little is that they've got this um, idea of AI being this solution to a lot of things, but understanding how those things integrate is where the challenges are lie. And so the, we, we've outlined these kind of nine things that we typically find as struggles. That uh, poor implementation is one of the areas, like not being able to really understand how this solution sits across different silos. How does the data flow from your end customers? But then there's a lot of softer things that really matter, the cultural change, the skills, the technical perception. People get a bit scared by the idea of AI if you're coming in from a non-techie background. If you go into a, a many HR functions today and you go, oh yeah, we're gonna start using AI to look at um, how we go through the process of vetting our candidates. Many people will go, oh, oh we, we like the human touch. And admittedly, there are downsides to using AI in those circumstances because of bias and things like that. And Boyan can talk to some of those ideas in his session later around kind of um, the bias that can get introduced. But if you're aware of these things, you can address them. So th there shouldn't be a fear, but there should be kind of a pragmatism as to where is the most appropriate. Um, what we've heard in the kind of briefing leading up to this session was that Data is a big part of um, what you guys have access to, but how do you make the most of it? And it's then kind of the last few points around big data deluge and data is how do you not get distracted? What are the pieces of data that are really, really important for you to focus on as opposed to, right, we've got this big data set, let's get some value out of it. Um, and what that does is you can have a lot of noise in there. What is the really relevant pertinent pieces of information? And this is where kind of taking a step back, understanding the business problem, understanding what are the drivers of that problem, and then kind of working towards what the most appropriate data is, what the most appropriate logic is to solve that for. So that instead of starting with a AI first lens, it's what is the business problem that we're trying to solve for? What are the things that we, what are the levers that we can pull on to address that problem? And then as a result, how can we use tools like AI, machine learning, to address that? And in some cases, you come to the conclusion that AI is not the solution, or it may only be part of the solution, and that you need to interact with process experts, you need to interact with um, people experts, training, all of those sorts of things. So as I mentioned, the, the kind of maturity, we see four, four stages. Many organizations are kind of in the first two stages, like they're exploring, they're kind of dabbling, they may have a crack team in one part of the organization that might go and dabble and try one use case here, one use case there, and it never really gets off, off the ground. The doing is then kind of the next stage that more of the organization, it might, might be more structured that you're trying to feed in these ideas but it's still incremental to the way that your organization functions today. You're not thinking differently. It's more about, right, how can we do what we're doing today in a more efficient manner or in a more effective manner? But as you start to shift towards the right-hand side, it's actually really thinking about how you operate as a business, not just the technology itself, but all of the operating components, your people, your process, your the underlying technology, the data, the logic, all of these pieces need to fit together and they may all need changing. And it's then understanding, well, what are the critical pieces of that need that need to change first to enable this? 
And so in my breakout, I, I'm going to break out those different um, operating model areas that we tend to address. And then what are the kind of key tips that we would suggest when you are looking at those areas? The being is really the hardest stage of this. You think about the likes of Amazon, Uber, those organizations have been built with digital in mind. Their whole business model is completely, they don't tend to have functions. They, they flow with the process. And that is by design because of the, the data, the way that they want to operate. And with many organizations that have been around and established, changing that kind of structure is much more difficult. It's ingrained, it's the way people operate. It's not something that will change overnight. And it is something that has to grow over time but it also needs pushing. It can't just, you need, you need a CDO or a CIO that will be spearheading this and say, no, this is the way that we want to operate and has executive buy into it. That was all I had to say in terms of an introduction. Um, as I say, the, the process that we go through is kind of end-to-end, -end. we call it the insight-driven organization framework. Um, that's consultants speak for how do you become more data-driven. Um, at the beginning, as I mentioned, it's what are you trying to achieve? It's then building the people around you, but then in parallel, it's identifying what are the things that we can go and dabble in whilst building those foundations. And as I say, those foundations are the areas that in my breakout I'm gonna elaborate on. The combination of those two things is how you can deploy at scale. And once you've done one area, that's where you can move on to the next, or you can deploy an extended team. Thank mm -hmm. you.